Summary of the Golden Compass by Philip Pullman Lyra, age 11, and her demon, Pan, try to get entry to the retiring room at Jordan College so that they can see the activities that take place there. She sees something shocking. The master puts poison in the wine that was meant for her loved but scary uncle, Lord Isreal. When Lord Isreal himself shows up, Lyra tells him to be careful. He lets her stay hidden and watch his talk about something he's been studying in the north called Dust. He shows a picture of the northern lights, which include a city. She doesn't understand most of what he and the scholars say, but they do talk about something called the Panzerburn and someone who, strangely, doesn't have a demon. Later, the master tells the librarian that he was trying to protect Lyra from Lord Isreal and from her fate, which is to unknowingly lead someone to their sacrifice. Lyra and her best friend, Roger, spend their time running around Jordan College and Oxford. The gobblers, who steal poor children and send them north by drawing them in with a beautiful woman named Mrs. Coulter, put an end to her happy life. The storyteller talks about how she fooled a boy named Tony Macarius. Lyra is crazy about the gobblers, but she is scared when they show up in Oxford and take an Egyptian boy named Billy Costa and maybe Roger as well. That night, the master asks her to join him and Mrs. Coulter for dinner. Mrs. Coulter is charming, and Lyra is happy to hear that she will be moving in with her. The master gives Lyra an alethiometer in the morning before she goes and tells her to keep it a secret. Lyra doesn't know what to do. Lyra is happy until Mrs. Coulter has a cocktail party one night. Mrs. Coulter loses her cool when Lyra insists on carrying the alethiometer around the house in a bag. Meanwhile, Lyra and Pan figure out that Mrs. Coulter's demon, a golden monkey, is watching them. Lyra finds out at the party that the gobblers are really the General Ablation Board, which is a group run by Mrs. Coulter. She also hears that Lord Isreal has been locked up by the Panzerburn, which are armored bears. Lyra gets scared and runs away. Tony Costa, Billy's older brother, and the Egyptians save Lyra from the kidnappers, and Ma Costa chooses to take Lyra with them to the Fens for a meeting of the Egyptians. They hide her because the cops want to find her. At the meeting, John FAA, the king of Egypt, says that they need to keep Lyra safe and tells everyone about a plan to save the children who have been taken. He and an old man named Farder Coram talk to Lyra alone after the meeting. She tells them everything she knows about Dust, Mrs. Coulter, and the Gobblers. The alethiometer is another thing she shows them. Farder Coram tells her that the device is telling the truth and says that she might need to take it to Lord Isreal. They also tell Lyra that Lord Isreal is her father and Mrs. Coulter is her mother. Ma Costa took care of Lyra when she was a baby. Three days later, the Egyptians get together again and start making plans for their trip. John FAA won't take Lyra with him. Lyra ties herself to Farder Coram and finds that she can read the alethiometer if she focuses. As she thinks about it one afternoon, a man who was hurt on a spy mission comes back, and Lyra understands that the alethiometer was trying to tell her about it. John FAA decides to take Lyra because of this. Lyra has to hide while the Egyptian men take her north, where they'll get a ship to Trollsund. Farther Coram lets her go outside one night after Lyra again can't figure out what the alethiometer is trying to say. When two spy flies attack Pan, they quickly figure out what it was trying to say. When they catch one, they find out that Mrs. Coulter sent them. Coram puts the one he has caught in a tin and seals it. Lyra decides pretty quickly that she loves the sea. Pan also likes it, so he tries out being a dolphin. This worries Lyra. But Jerry, a sailor, tells her that Pan will settle in some way in the end, which is good because then Lyra will know who she is. Farder Coram takes Lyra to Trollsund to see Dr. Lancelius, who is the witch's governor. Farder Coram helped a witch 40 years ago, and the witch asked him to do something for her in return. Dr. Lancelius tells them that there is a business in town that brings children in quietly and takes them inland. Then he asks Lyra about the device. Dr. Lancelius tells Farder Coram that Lyra will save the world while she is playing outside. He also suggests that the Egyptians fight an armed bear named Iarek Bernison. When they meet Iarek, 
The fact that he doesn't have Admon scares Lyra. He agrees to work for the Egyptians if they can find him and give him back his armor. That night, Lyra wakes up in the middle of the night to look at the Aurora and sees the city. Kaisa, the goose Mon of the witch Serafina Pakala, stops her. He tells John FAA and Farder Coram how to get to Balvanger, where the children go to be scared. He says it has to do with dust, and he says that Lord Israel wants to use dust to build a bridge between this world and other worlds, which is a political mess. They talk about the bears and their role in the war, and Lyra argues that they need to help Irek get his armor back. In the morning, Lyra meets up with the Egyptians at a cafe. Lee Scoresby, a balloonist, tells Lyra that she needs to help Irek get his armor right away, before the people of the town move it. She runs away, but when she gets close to Irek, she stops because she is afraid to get closer. Pan changes into a badger to try to get her closer. It hurts, but he does it. Irek says that his protection is his soul, and for him to be whole, he needs it. Lyra tells him where his armor is, and when Irek comes out of the cave wearing it, he looks strong and complete. That afternoon, the Egyptians, Irek, and Lee Scorus believe. During a break, the alethiometer tells Lyra that there is a ghost in a town nearby. John FAA says that she can look at it. Lyra finds something terrifying in the village, Tony Macarius has been cut off from his demon. Tony dies a few hours after Lyra takes him back to the Egyptians. Irek and Lyra talk about souls later that day, and Irek shows her that bears can't be tricked. He says that they know things in a different way, which is the same way that Lyra is able to read the alethiometer. Not long after that, the Tartars set up a trap for the Egyptians and take Lyra. Lyra tells them her name is Lizzie because they don't know who she is. Lyra thinks that Balvanger is where the Tartars take her. Sister Clara lets Lyra keep the alethiometer, and Lyra puts the spy fly in her bag without her sister's knowledge. The girls in Lyra's room tell her that the doctors test them for dust and that one by one, children leave and never come back. Also, they say that Mrs. Coulter will be there in two days. Lyra finds Roger the next day. They act like they don't care about each other until lunchtime, when a girl says she was with Tony Macarius when they took him. They told him that he would be getting a little cut. When Lyra later finds Billy Costa, she tells him that the Egyptians are coming. Roger says that kids can hide in the roof. A fire drill will take place later, the doctor says. That afternoon, Lyra is given a test for dust. The fire alarm goes off during the tests. They decide Lyra can wear the furs she brought with her. Lyra starts a snowball fight outside so that she, Billy, and Roger can sneak a look around. Kaisa joins them and helps Lyra break into a shed, where she finds the ghostly demons of children whose heads were cut off. He saves the demons, and Lyra goes back to the children. As the doctors are getting the kids back inside, Mrs. Coulter shows up. Lyra hears from one of the other girls that Mrs. Coulter usually talks to the doctors in the meeting room. That night, Lyra climbs up into the attic and listens in on Mrs. Coulter's talk. She and the doctors talk about a new way to separate children from the demons that got away. The doctors talk about how mean Mrs. Coulter is after she leaves. Lyra starts to cry out on her own, and they find her. They decide to cut her to make her stop talking, but just as they are about to do it, Mrs. Coulter comes in and saves Lyra. Mrs. Coulter acts like she cares about Lyra, tries to make her feel better, and tells her that dust is bad. She wants the alethiometer, says Lord is real, shouldn't get it, and thinks it's in Lyra's pack. She finds the spy fly tin in the pack, and the bug flies into her face. Lyra runs away, sets fire to the kitchen, and then takes the other children away from Balvanger. Irek saves them from the Tartar guards, and the kids make it to the Egyptians in the end. There, Mrs. Coulter tries to take Lyra and Roger again, but Lee Scoresby saves them and takes them up with Irek in his rocket. They are pulled towards Svalbard by the witches. As the balloon floats, Lee Scoresby and Serafina Pakala talk about how fate affects morals. Serafina says that they all have a fate, 
but that they have to act like they have free will to feel in charge. She and Lyra talk later about what makes a bear easy to trick. Serafina says that bears who act like people can be tricked. Not long after that, the balloon is attacked by cliff ghasts, which are dangerous flying animals, and Lyra falls out. Two bears find her and take her to Iafer Rachnison's stinky, bird poop covered castle. The alethiometer tells Lyra that Iarek is coming, and a scholar who is in jail tells Lyra that Iafer will kill Iarek if he does come. Lyra knows that Iafer wants Admon more than anything else in the world. When a guard comes to bring food, she uses this information to get to Iafer and tell him in secret that she is actually Iarek Dmon, but he can win her for himself if he fights Iarek in single combat. Iafer says yes right away. Lyra tells Iarek what she's done when he gets there. Iarek is amazed and happy that Lyra was able to trick Iafer. He takes advantage of this to trick Iafer into losing the fight. He starts to take apart the house and then agrees to take Lyra and Roger to Lord Isreal. Lord Isreal goes crazy when he sees Lyra at his house, but he calms down when he sees Roger. That night, he tells Lyra that the Magisterium thinks dust is proof of original sin, and Mrs. Coulter thinks that taking a child from their dmon will keep them from having original sin. Lord Isreal doesn't think this goes far enough. He wants to use the energy made when a kid is separated from their dmon to cross into the other world. He says he doesn't need the alethiometer, which makes Lyra confused. In the middle of the night, Lyra wakes up and finds out that Lord Isreal has taken Roger to use in his project. Iarek brings her up the mountain to catch up with them. They stop for a short time so Iarek can fight Mrs. Coulter's friends but Iarek has to let Lyra go on her own in the end. At the top of the mountain, Lyra can't stop Lord Isreal from attaching a wire to Roger's demon. This lights up the aurora and rips the sky open to show a bridge to another world, killing Roger in the process. Lord Isreal kisses Mrs. Coulter when she comes in, but she won't go with him. Lord Isreal crosses the bridge on foot. Lyra and Pan decide that dust must be a good thing when they are alone. They also decide to cross the bridge to find out where dust comes from. About the author Philip Pullman's family lived in North Wales while his father wasn't traveling for work as a Royal Air Force pilot. When Pullman was seven, his father died, and his mother got a new husband. Pullman was young when he first read Paradise Lost by John Milton. Later, he was drawn to the pictures of William Blake. Both would have a big impact on Pullman's later work, especially his dark materials. Pullman taught kids in middle school and wrote plays for kids starting in the late 1960s. His first book for kids, Count Carlstein, was based on these shows. Pullman started writing his dark materials in 1993 while he was teaching at Oxford. After the book came out, he quit teaching to write full-time. The whole series has won a lot of awards, but the Golden Compass and the Amber Spyglass have won the most. Pullman has been a supporter of not putting age or gender labels on children's books his whole life. He has also spoken up for writers' rights to fair pay for speaking events and ebook library loans. Pullman has enjoyed the criticism of his dark materials because he is an atheist and a critic of Christianity. He even asked his publisher to include a critical quote from 1999 in the Amber Spyglass. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.